Today on Biomass Energy Journal, we're going to address the carbon question. Right now, EPA policy has shifted its stance on the carbon neutrality of biomass in large-scale plants. It's sending a shockwave through the industry, and so we went to Oregon Congressman Kurt Schrader and asked his response to the EPA move. He's one of 63 congressmen who was a part of the letter rebuking the EPA's new policy shift. We're also going to cover the Manomet study and talk about where that went right and where it went horribly wrong. It's the study that spawned the headline, Biomass Worse Than Coal in 2050. I'm going to show you the metrics they used and how they were flawed, but there's also some bright spots in that report too that I don't want to let slide. Then we're going to talk about the EPA tailoring rule in more depth and the consequences of the Boiler Act on the biomass industry. But right now, let's start with Congressman Kurt Schrader. Well, we've been very specific with uh, uh, Lisa Jackson. We've uh, co-sponsored a letter with a bunch of other members, a bipartisan letter, I think up to 63 members, saying that it's totally unacceptable. Right now, EPA is rewriting uh, history. Their own, their own research shows that uh, biomass, uh, combustible biomass, is, is carbon neutral. And they've taken some unilateral stance with no scientific evidence whatsoever to say the opposite. So it's, uh, you know, they're playing politics, which I think is unfortunate. We really need to have all people uh, in the room here, and it's a win-win-win to, uh, to go back to having that as, uh, uh, you know, carbon neutral. I, th I think it's very, very disconcerting to those of us that have rural representations with a lot of forests uh, that they're changing the science here. A lot of these men and women have made uh, huge investments, uh, put in their own uh, combustible bio biomass unit, supplies power to the local community. They're a fairly isolated community at very reasonable rates. Uh, you know, without this, it's going to go through the Rue Heron uh, paper company. Done a lot to improve a lot of its uh, output and stuff. Actually got a awards for reducing uh, particulate matter. And uh, now they're being asked to go uh, the extra mile. So I think between that and the uh, uh, the boiler standards that they're coming out with, it's going to be really, really difficult. Oregon has a great reputation uh, stepping up. Uh, biomass is one of the great tools that binds urban and rural America, uh, uh, urban and rural Oregon together. Uh, it's a great way to get in there and create healthy forests. We've been preaching that for a long time. It's a nice bipartisan issue. Uh, uh, Congressman Greg Walden uh, has been preaching this for a long time. Uh, I've got clients that are uh, clients, I'm a veterinarian in the real yeah. world, <laughs> constituents that are very interested in uh, uh, continuing to build plants and or augment the plants they've got, but they're afraid. I mean, uh, there could be a huge economic impact here if we just don't uh, get behind the fact that biomass is a very legitimate, uh, historically efficient way to, uh, frankly, reduce our carbon footprint, uh, create energy independence, and uh, create a lot of green energy jobs. It's, it's really important that uh, we change the attitude of EPA. EPA, uh, from my one year's experience in Congress, it's shocking how out of touch they are. When I asked uh, uh, some of the staff people about what their biggest concern was about getting into the forest, getting that slash out, instead of burning it and creating you know, a, a dirty carbon footprint, let's sequester that stuff, let's use that for combustible mass, they were concerned about deforestation. That's the comment they made. And so I'm thinking, these group, these people are so out of touch that it's very important that congressional folks, hopefully other people in the industry here in our great state that are pioneers and leaders, been pioneers and leaders for years. I have people making charcoal briquettes uh, that are doing a wonderful job. I've got people doing uh, uh, all sorts of innovative community service deals. We've actually introduced legislation from the Northwest based on that to try and use combustible biomass uh, to actually help uh, power schools, hospitals, other buildings uh, in the local communities where it's so expensive that we can't get the power that they need. So this is not the force of the 1970s. Uh, this is the new, I think, cutting edge uh, renewable energy force of the 21st century. Let's let them do what they do best. Here I have the Manomet report. This is a study done for Massachusetts forests. And it got a lot of headlines, salacious headlines, in fact. And I'm going to talk about what the report did right and what it did wrong. So to start with, what, what they did right and what was very interesting is they set up a, a metric to determine when is biomass carbon neutral in the atmosphere. So if, if you use biomass and you combust it, there's an immediate debt. There's more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But as new biomass grows, it pulls that carbon back out of the atmosphere to the point where in some series of years, it'll create an actual dividend. 
And so this is a really interesting concept for our industry to say, hey, this forest slash will start paying dividends in nine years, or these whole tree harvesting techniques will take decades, but they'll still pay a dividend. And so for that reason, I think it was a good concept. It's a concept that industry needs to build on. But the way the science was presented and the metrics they used were far from accurate and far from representative. And so I want to cover those as well. Here you see on the graph, if you cut down a whole tree and you follow the black line, the carbon debt, the debt of carbon in the atmosphere, isn't paid off for a few decades. But it does turn into a carbon dividend over some period of time. And that means more CO2 is being sequestered than was previously sequestered before. And so it's using the forest as an active carbon sink. Now, if you look up at the green line, the dividend and the debt payback time are much different. Slash and waste sources have a much shorter payback, and they start making immediate dividends as biomass energy products. So what the report is saying is that we can have a real benefit as far as atmospheric CO2 reduction from the use of biomass. Now they chose to use the whole tree here as the worst possible metric. And I hear where I'm going to show you where the report goes a little off. All right, so all carbon is not created equal. Sure, we measure CO2 in the atmosphere as a final product. We have to understand where that carbon came from. Fossil carbon is carbon that's sequestered. This is where we're getting our fossil fuels. This is why we have more carbon in the atmosphere, because we're pulling it out of the ground, out of sequestration, putting it into the atmosphere. Then we have biogenic carbon. This is the carbon that cycles through trees and plants and other biomass. Biomass grows, assumes carbon, maturity, decay releases it. Now what this Manomet report failed to do was distinguish between biogenic and fossil carbon. It completely disregarded the line. This is the line our industry has to protect. This line is the difference between mass pollution or environmental stewardship. All right, so let's look at some of these results. Combustion emissions on the left, coal and biomass. Biomass does produce more CO2 emissions because it's less energy dense. To get the same kilowatt, you have to burn more biomass. This much is true. But what they don't account for is if you burn the coal and not the biomass, then they didn't account for the biomass decay because that biomass is still out there, still in some element of decay. And so that biomass wasn't factored in and, and added to those coal emissions, which are being pulled up from the ground and being put into the atmosphere that aren't normally there. Back to the original graph, you see the decay section was completely disregarded, and that's what allowed them to produce the results that they did, to produce a headline that says, you know, biomass worse than coal in 2050, because they weren't accounting for any sort of biomass decay, and because they're, they're focusing on the carbon in the atmosphere, they're not segmenting whether they're talking about biogenic carbon or fossil carbon. You know, the regulators and the report writers, they're looking at the CO2 emissions through a keyhole, and that keyhole is the stack. But when <laughs> they don't have emission sensors out in the forest rating the amount of CO2 decay and, and methane release. Here's a quote from the next report we're going to cover, and what it essentially says is it's much more environmentally friendly in terms of greenhouse gas emissions to use waste biomass for electrical production rather than let it decompose. Let's talk about what the report kind of only glanced over, and that's waste, which is where most of our industry actually exists. This is a quote from page 110, buried in the back. All bioenergy technologies, even biomass electric power compared to natural gas electric, look favorable when biomass waste wood is compared to fossil fuel alternatives. Five takeaways from the Manomet report that probably didn't make the news. Number one, biomass can quickly pay atmospheric carbon dividends, lowering CO2 emissions. Two, using waste sources is favorable even to natural gas. And number three, CO2 from biomass decay wasn't added to the final fossil fuel emissions numbers, thus skewing is in the numbers and the timelines. They're conducting pinhole science here through the emission stacks and not accounting for the forest release or, or wherever the biomass is. Number four, the whole tree metrics used in the report were completely misleading and didn't represent the U.S. forest industry. It was possibly a better representation of Sweden. And number five, the line between biogenic carbon and fossil carbon, I mean, it's, it's the Earth's surface, you're walking on it, it's under attack. That line is where all the science is in the favor of biomass. And to confuse the two forms of carbon in the atmosphere is a huge environmental mistake. 
So we set up a page for all these resources on, on the Biomass Fuels Summit. And um, you can get the report I just went over, the Manomet report. You can download it from there. And you can also download the next report as well as some others. And the website is biomassfuelssummit.com forward slash EPA. The Bioenergy and Greenhouse Gases Report put out by the Pacific Institute, written by Greg Morris, is really about all the missing pieces of where the Manomet study was. It spends a good time covering the decay processes. And this one quote I really want to read to you, this second paragraph. However, bioenergy facilities emit carbon that is already a part of the active carbon cycle and converts waste that when conventionally disposed of produce greater amounts of greenhouse gas emissions than when used for power generation. Take the time to read this report. It's a really top-notch report. The EPA tailoring rule, the rule that determines which emitters will be required to account for the greenhouse gas emissions in January 2011 when the agency formally begins regulating those emissions as part of the Clean Air Act did two things. One, it actually raised the threshold for emitters to avoid a flood of permit requests. But two, and this sent a shockwave through the industry, is they did not exempt biomass. So plants emitting more than 100,000 tons of CO2 per year will fall under this rule even if it's biomass, biomass which has historically been carbon neutral. This policy reversal is in direct contradiction to the EPA's own recent policy and congressional legislative intent. As a result, project funding for large-scale biomass projects is evaporating. The industry is frankly scared. It doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know what this means. And the EPA is not communicating with us clearly enough to signal any sort of path forward. And so what we've done is we've actually invited the EPA to participate, to shed some light on this. You know, is there new science they're working from? What is their policy intent in the future? Is this going to keep coming down the pipeline to where all biomass will be regulated as carbon on the same platform as, as fossil fuels, in which case we're taking away our best tool against climate change and, and just dumping more carbon in the atmosphere? And now the Boiler Mac, the Boiler Mac is a tough, some say unreachable set of standards that will require boilers to meet new stringent emission standards. The unit's test for baseline performance by the EPA use uncommonly dry and sized wood, delivering emissions results that can't be readily achieved with commercially available wood. So the effect that this is going to have on the industry is it's going to literally cause boilers and industrial applications to shudder and switch back over to fossil fuels, to gas, to natural gas, in order to comply with these regulations. And this is a real step back, backward for the industry. Our company is uh, Bioenergy. We make fast pyrolysis uh, systems that make an advanced biofuel called BioOil, plus a byproduct called Biochar. We use the BioOil as a power plant fuel, so we make electrons is what we're doing. Uh, I think the future is great because uh, wind and solar energy, of course, are intermittent power, where biomass is a firm power. It is the renewable component that the grid requires to have stable power. So if we're going to build past a small percentage of renewable power, we have to have some firm component, and biomass is the answer there. We believe that the forest biomass is greenhouse gas neutral because uh, trees needed CO2 to grow, and uh, when you combust it, you release the CO2, so it's a growth cycle. So it will not increase the greenhouse gas effect by burning this material. What I'm, I'm hoping uh, public to know is that uh, uh, we are not uh, cutting trees in discriminately. We are not going to do any uh, clear cutting of trees. What we are doing is we are going to use only the forest waste. So if uh, people do logging, we just use the tree tops and branches. Or if you, they do forest thinning, we just use the leftover product and uh, we'll leave a uh, substantial amount of biomass on the forest floor to protect the fish and wildlife. So we'll be a, a, a friendly uh, commercial en entity for environmental people and uh, uh, fish and wildlife. 